It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today I'm going to tell you about uh, some experimental work, mostly, uh, done at Stanford University, where we're trying to push the uh, boundaries of uh, quantum mechanics in, uh, along uh, the direction of how large a spatial superposition can we make where large is really uh, in terms of how far separated uh, two quantum entities can be, uh, and also uh, along the lines of how large can they be in terms of the, the number of uh, particles in, in the superposition. Uh, today, I'm, gonna, I'm mainly in this talk, mainly focus on the, uh, the, the first aspect of largeness. And I think the, uh, you know, the intellectual uh, interest in this problem is well known. And uh, it's, it basically asks the question, uh, you know, where, where does quantum mechanics uh, end and the classical world begin? And are there uh, limits that we can discern uh, along uh, with, with the kind of tests that we do, that, which involve uh, atom de Broglie wave interferometry? So uh, what I show you on this, this, this illustration on the cover uh, slide are, are two ensembles of, of atoms uh, that are, uh, this, this picture is taken at the midpoint uh, in an uh, atom de Broglie wave interferometer. And actually, these ensembles are separated by almost a meter, actually 54 centimeters. And uh, over the course of the talk, I want to explain to you uh, how, how we actually produce uh, these entangled states uh, and uh, how we uh, observe uh, interference with them, and then sort of go into some of the possible applications that may ensue. So uh, for those of you not familiar with the field of atom de Broglie wave interferometry, uh, kind of the, 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 the experiment that uh, was the beginning of this field, I think, traces back to uh, Jurgen Linick's work in Constance in 1991, where uh, with a beam of metastable helium atoms, uh, he did the analogous uh, experiment to the Young's double slit experiment. And so just to take you quickly through this beautiful experiment, uh, you start off with a metastable beam of helium atoms. Uh, these, these atoms are made to illuminate a narrow slit. The slit dimensions chosen to be small enough that for the, the parameters characteristic of, of this atomic source, uh, that would uh, produce at the other side of the slit a set of, uh, of cylindrically diffracting wave fronts. And uh, these, these uh, wave fronts, uh, they diffract because uh, per basic non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the atom is described as a wave uh, whose wavelength is inversely proportional uh, to its momentum. Uh, and if you, those, those wave fronts uh, diffract and are made to uh, co coherently illuminate uh, two more slits, mechanical slits also narrow. And uh, coherently meaning that I can think of that wave function as being uh, having a same phase front or a well-defined phase front at that location and that location. And that property emerges from the geometry of this apparatus. That, that coherent illumination then gives rise to uh, two more uh, de Broglie uh, wave fronts that eventually overlap. And per the rule of quantum mechanics, add before you square, uh, that overlap leads uh, uh, to an interference pattern, which experimentally is manifest in a probability of, of detecting a helium atom at a, a given location on a detection screen. And Linick and co-workers observed that interference uh, by scanning the position of uh, a detector along this uh, interference uh, region and observing an oscillation in the number of helium atoms which were detected as a function of position, as shown down here. So this is the position of the detector. Uh, this is the number of counts. Uh, note the count rate is fairly low. At the time, this was a challenging experiment. Uh, hundreds of counts in a five-minute interval. And you see this oscillation. And the period of that oscillation is just given by a simple uh, application of Schrodinger equation. Uh, another thing to note here is that this distance scale, the characteristic distance between these fringes, is small. It's only 10 microns. And to make this experiment work, uh, re required a mastery of microfabrication techniques. All right, conceptual importance of this experiment. Well, uh, since the early 20th century, it was known that massive particles could interfere. And uh, you, know, you, have, you don't understand uh, the hydrogen spectra if you don't understand wave interference for electrons. Davidson Germer, you have to accept that matter waves of electrons interfere. Uh, neutron interferometry, we have beautiful examples in the 70s of, uh, of matter also interfering. So what's the point here? Well, the point was that uh, the atom is a more complicated object than a, a simple fundamental particle. And in fact, while uh, you could, if you were a believer in quantum mechanics, you could trust the, uh, the, the, the you could you could trust what the Schrodinger equation was telling you ought to happen. It's a different thing to go and experimentally observe that. 
Now, uh, in the mid 50s, uh, some I mean, people had been envisioning uh, maybe doing uh, massive particle interference experiments with atomic matter, uh, er, you know, f for decades. Uh, and there were some early theorists that basically said, well, while you can think of this uh, as something interesting to do in theory, in practice, forget it. You're never going to be able to, in practice, build the device where the uh, wave fronts of uh, the interfering de Broglie waves would be stable enough to uh, observe interference. And so uh, I think that, you know, those arguments, Schwinger was uh, articulated some of them, uh, kind of put, put the field off the track uh, for, for, for a number of years. But eventually, uh, the experimentalists were, became clever and figured out how to uh, build such a device. I think Schwinger had in mind doing something with Stern-Gerlach magnets, which quite, I think is quite correct. That probably uh, wouldn't have worked. All right, so that's where the, that started the field. And once you have an example of an experiment that works, then you, know, you let your imagination run wild, and you say, well, can I build an interferometer, uh, other, other methods, and so forth. And uh, that's this field, my field, uh, Adam de Broglie wave interferometry, has now been maturing for uh, nearly a quarter century. And so now I want to fast forward to uh, some recent data that came out of my group uh, at, at Stanford, and I want to show you uh, uh, ensembles of atoms, which I will claim uh, each atom in these ensembles is in a quantum superposition state separated by uh, a distance of 54 centimeters just before I take this picture. And so each one of these, where you see peaks here, that's where you have lots of atoms, uh, in this case close to uh, 10 to the 5, uh, in some cases approaching 10 to the 6 atoms. And for each and every atom in this ensemble, uh, I, my claim is that its, its proper wave function description is as being in a superposition state between this location and that location, and this distance scale being 54 centimeters. 54 centimeters is the distance from my elbow to the tip of my finger there, and that's starting, I'd argue, starting to be macroscopic. To, to put this uh, separation in kind of the um, a colloquial scale, you say, well, what's the size of an atom? Size of an atom, half an angstrom, 54 centimeters, half a meter, there are 10 orders of magnitude difference between the size of the atom and the separation. Now, of course, we know quantum mechanics is there to make things a little easier when you, when you I, I'm going to argue that I can, I'll show you that I can make these wave functions interfere, thereby establishing the fact that they're in co coherent superposition. But uh, just to, by analogy, kind of, uh, if you think classically, if you call the atom the size of a golf ball, then separating that golf ball by 54 times its, uh, uh, 10 to the 10 times its uh, diameter, which is the ratio of a hex, half an angstrom to half a meter, is basically taking the golf ball, putting part of it on the moon, and then bringing it back and seeing what happens. So th that analogy uh, is admittedly misleading. What it, what it does, I, why I bring that up is to say that there are some experimental challenges uh, to, to make such an observation of coherence uh, at this distance scale, uh, uh, realize it in the laboratory. Okay, so uh, once I take this, according to quantum mechanics, once I take that picture, no chance of uh, determining uh, or seeing superposition because I've, for each and every atom in the superposition, I've collapsed this state either to the left side or the right side, the left peak or the right peak. And uh, after, after that, they behave as if they can't, they're, they're, they're classical trajectories, uh, not in this uh, bifurcated situation. But before I take that picture, the way to think about the wave function is a wave function where the atom is, here I speak very loosely for those of you who are sticklers about foundations of quantum mechanics, the atom is very loosely in two places at once. And uh, now, while an atom is, uh, still seems like a pretty simple particle, it's a lot more complicated than an electron or a neutron, or for sure a photon. It's, uh, the, the rubidium-87 atoms we use are collections of a lot of particles. And arguably, uh, what we're doing when we create this superposition state is creating a, a, a pretty well-controlled Schrodinger cat that's where, where two parts of the cat are separated by uh, 54 centimeters. And that cat is not something that's so macroscopic that it has lots of floppy degrees of internal, lots of floppy internal degrees of freedom, and I have to worry about temperature. But it's still an atom. It's just a bunch of particles that uh, are, you know, kind of by the energy scales of the interactions that make atoms, make it a very, a very controlled quantum system. But this is, uh, to me, amazing that something as complicated of an atom can separate by uh, this distance and then yet still be made to interfere. So um, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself. I want to prove to you that each atom is in a superposition. And the way I prove it to you operationally is to 
uh, take those two peaks and bring them back together and see if they uh, behave as waves would and exhibit uh, interference phenomena. So uh, let me show you some apparatus and I'll show you data that demonstrates that we do in fact see a qu quantum interference for those waves. So uh, this is the apparatus in the basement of the uh, physics building at Stanford. And let me just kind of take you through some of the, the relevant pieces. So here's the, uh, the real apparatus, but everything looks good in CAD. So let's go to the, the left side of the screen and take a look at the CAD rendering. So uh, we use uh, kind of now well-defined methods in laser cooling uh, and of, of atomic physics, uh, Bose-Einstein condensation and so forth to create a very cold ensemble of, of, of atoms. And we, we like them to be cold because once they're cold, the spread in the Broglie wavelength associated with this ensemble is, is small. It's, it's like doing interferometry with a large coherent length source. I like the, 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 the wavelength of the source to do interferometry well defined. So by cooling atoms down to low temperature, I, I get a well defined, uh, if you will, spectral control over the interfering source. I also uh, solve another problem, and that is uh, usually, like when you think of atoms in this room, they're moving around at speeds of kilometers per second. And so uh, if I know the atom is here at, at one point in time, it doesn't take much time for the atom to be hitting the wall on the other side of the, of, of the room if it's at a high temperature. But if I refrigerate it to temperatures, uh, we use temperatures on the order of 100 picokelvins, if I refrigerate them to that low temperature, and what I mean by temperature is that, that energy, uh, Boltzmann's constant times temperature, is energy which is equal to the kinetic energy spread of the wave function associated with an individual atom. When I'm at that temperature of 100 picokelvin, the atom uh, wave function will spread out at a, at a, a speed of you know, taking into account the mass of the atom and so forth, that's just hundreds of microns per second. So if I know I have an atom at, at this location of time t equals zero, then if I wait for three seconds, which is the time it takes an atom to be, this is what we do, we launch the cloud of atoms up this 10 meter tube, they fall back down, it takes them about three seconds to go up and down. That cloud of atoms, or the wave function of an individual atom, has not spread out very much at all. And so uh, before we do any interferometry, uh, any of the fancy stuff, uh, one thing I find amazing is I can make this ensemble of uh, 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 atoms, and then using light and mirrors and tricks to uh, make the atoms move vertically with respect to the lab frame, I can launch this ball of atoms up this tube. They go up as if it was the, each atom was, this, this ensemble was behaving as if it was just uh, uh, an ensemble of sand particles that I launched up the tube and they fall back down. They, 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 they go up, they turn around, and they come back down. And uh, if I were to say, well, where are the atoms? Well, I could learn that by taking a picture of them. Uh, and I take a picture of them by scattering light, which is resonant with one of the atomic transitions. When the light hits the, the atom, it, it's, it scatters in, in, through in, in, in all directions. And I collect some of that light with a camera that's, that's located off to the side. And then I just do some standard imaging optics, and I can tell you where those atoms are. And at these temperatures, the small ball of atoms goes up, and it comes back down and I see a small ball of atoms, literally less than a millimeter in size, uh, after three seconds. All right, so uh, this is the, this is the uh, atomic source, and there's lots of jargon associated with creating this un initial ensemble of atoms. One of the things that we have to do, it's not sufficient just to make a Bose-Einstein condensate. We have to further cool. Uh, because the chemical potential of the condensate makes the atom cloud kind of want to explode. Uh, what, just the interactions between the atoms, and so we use a trick known as delta kick cooling to further uh, uh, manipulate the, uh, the momentum spread of the wave packets so it's at this, this very low level. Uh, how do we make it launch up and down this tube? Well, what we do is we uh, use a force of, from a light beam uh, on, on the atoms to manipulate their velocities. And, and here's what we do. We create a, a standing wave of light by interfering two counter-propagating beams. And by applying a frequency shift to one of the beams with respect to the other, we make the nodes of that standing wave uh, move with respect to the lab frame at the velocity we want to launch the atoms up the tube. And uh, just before we, we do that frequency shift, uh, we, we load the atoms into this corrugated potential. We can do that because the light polarizes the atom and there's an interaction force. And so the atoms kind of are glued to this washboard potential, which we then make move at a fixed relative velocity uh, with respect to the lab frame. And that sends the atoms on their way up and down this tube, and then we detect them down there. <laughs> 
Okay. The interferometry is realized with also moment, momentum exchange between atom and light field. Every time an atom scatters a photon, just conservation of momentum, you can work this out through non-relativistic Schrodinger equation, but just by conservation of momentum, the velocity of the atom has to change by five millimeters per second. So uh, this gives us a nice way of, of manipulating the velocity of an atom or its wave uh, packet components just by controlled light scattering. As I'll explain on the next slide, I won't, I won't give you all the details here, what we do to create a Max Zander-like uh, de Broglie wave interferometer is after the atom has been launched into this tube, we apply a, a sequence of light pulses appropriately tuned. And due to momentum exchange with the light field, this creates a situation where as this cloud is flying, each and every atom in that cloud uh, will, will in, have a, its wave function described by one which splits, separates at the top of the trajectory of which we choose uh, by the launch velocity down there at the top of the trajectory. The wave functions are separated by 54 centimeters. If I don't take a picture, I use these pulses of light to bring the wave functions back together. And if, if all is working well, I, I might be lucky enough to see interference as manifested by kind of wave-like ripples on the wave function uh, at when I take a look at uh, their dis density distribution at this location. Uh, so let's go to that analogy between a golf ball and the moon. <laughs> what things do I have to control to make this work? Well, one of the, the dominant uh, uh, effects for us is the rotation of the Earth. And in fact, as the Earth rotates, the entire apparatus, if you will, over this two-second period is, is swinging through an angle given by the rotation rate of the Earth. Meanwhile, the atoms have now, uh, after they've been launched by this light, they are in inertial freefall, and they're just going up and coming down this apparatus. And we have Coriolis effect that if we don't do anything to accommodate, will lead to complete uh, lack of possibility of seeing interference. And so this, this little picture here is of a mirror which is located at the bottom of part of the apparatus, bolted to the floor of our laboratory, whose angle changes uh, just enough to, to exactly compensate the rotation of the Earth. And why is that mirror important? Well, that, to, to drive these interference uh, transitions, we take a laser beam, we, we, we propagate it down the tube, we reflect it off this mirror, and it, it comes back. And uh, the angle of that mirror is directly proportional to, sets the, the axis of the momentum transfer uh, for this, this recoil momentum that we'll, we'll use to spatially divide, redirect, and recombine the atomic wave packet. We also have to worry about anything that exerts a spurious force on the atoms. So if there's a stray magnetic field gradient, bad news, because that will lead to a coupling with a magnetic moment of the atom that will change its velocity, its momentum, its wavelength, and lead to a, a situation where uh, I do not have enough stable stability between interfering paths that I will not see uh, in well-defined interference fringes. So uh, we have a three-layer mu metal uh, magnetic shield, which uh, takes the magnetic field over this 10-meter interaction region to well below uh, one milligauss in homogeneity. Right, so those are, that's some of the ex experimental details. Uh, let me back out to a cartoon to kind of explain how the uh, atom interference works. So I mentioned that we use a sequence of light pulses, and so let me take you through that pulse sequence. Uh, here is a conceptual rendering of what I showed you on the last slide. Uh, and uh, this is the initial cloud of atoms, 10 to the 5 atoms. Uh, and they're launched 13 meters per second with this lattice up this tube, and they fall back down. I've displaced the trajectories there just so you can see what's going on. Actually, everything's happening along a, a, a single axis. So this is just uh, to help explain. And of course, they're decelerating and accelerating due to gravity, which is responsible for these uh, vertical trajectories. OK, so uh, here is a space-time diagram. This is time, and this is uh, uh, position. And what I'm plotting here is the relative position of the, the two uh, atomic wave packets as they, they go through this interferometer. And I'm doing so in a reference frame that's, if you will, falling with the lower arm of the interferometer. So it's in the, in the frame that's, that's moving up and then falling down uh, with, with uh, one of the arms of the, uh, the interferometer. And here's how I make an interferometer. So uh, at, at time t equals zero, we come in with one pulse of light, which by analogy with MRI spectroscopy, we call a pi over two pulse. What this pulse of light is, uh, is uh, it's, it's associated with a standing wave that Bragg diffracts uh, atoms off the potential uh, induced by the light field. 
And by choosing the regime for diffraction appropriately, you're familiar with this when you take light and you scatter it off a grating. When you scatter light off a grating, you see a Bragg diffracted peak, and uh, that peak uh, doesn't necessarily have the full intensity of the beam in it. it. It could take part of the intensity and put it into drag Bragg diffracted peak, and part of the intensity uh, will not be diffracted. And if you think about what's happening in that optical experiment, one photon at a time, what you're doing is creating a superposition between the momentum of the photons as a result of that interaction with the grating. Well, we're doing the same thing here with atoms interacting with a corrugated uh, potential of light. We choose the interaction time, which we have easily under control just by how we control the intensity and duration of the laser pulses, so that we have a 50-50 a, a diffraction situation where half of the, uh, the wave function of uh, the incident atom is diffracted to a different momentum state, and the other half is undiffracted. This is a beam splitter, and so long as I now uh, have a way of controlling those two arms, I, am, I am, have the first element of building a de Broglie wave interferometer. So things start off with this first beam splitter pulse via a, a Bragg uh, transition, and then we follow that pulse with a sequence of pi pulses, which now are tuned to be almost unity efficiency for taking one well-defined momentum state and putting it into another defined momentum state. And we, uh, we have the, Dopp the Doppler effect being able to provide uh, a labeling for these two arms so that we can tune the lasers so that we can only transfer momentum to one of the arms of the interferometer and leave the other arm alone, for example. So after that beam splitter, in comes a sequence of a lot of pulses. In, in the work I'm going to describe, 54 centimeters, uh, it's, it's like almost 50 pulses that then we use to, this diagram is not to scale, but used to impart relative momentum of an atom, a part of the wave function in this arm with respect to uh, its partner wave function in that arm. And after this sequence here, which takes uh, you know, a couple of milliseconds, now I have a situation where I have uh, this bifurcated wave function, they're flying apart from each other at close to a meter per second. So I just have to wait. I wait a half a sec, I wait a full second, they're about a half meter separated. And that's where I took that first picture. Now, I choose to see interference instead, hopefully, and so I don't take the picture. Instead, I give a, a bunch more pulses to one arm of the interferometer and another arm of the interferometer. And uh, as, as, so this is the 54 centimeter point. Uh, more momentum uh, comes here, and this leads to a situation by design which brings the wave function, pa wave packets back together. And at some time, about two seconds later, another second later, sorry, two seconds after I've launched, the, 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 the uh, wave packets overlap. I come in with a final beam splitting pulse, and uh, I create an interferometer situation where I have one output port and another output port. And the population, the probability for an atom to be in that output port is going to depend on the relative phase of this arm with respect to that arm. And I detect that interference by counting the number of particles that, just like I, I, I do in photon interferometers or neutron interferometers or electron interferometers, I count the number of particles in each one of these ports. In this case, by uh, just resonance fluorescence, I scatter light off this bifurcated wave function and image it on a CCD camera. All right, so that, that's the experimental scheme. Now let me show you what happens when we do that. So uh, here's false color pictures that are representative of the intensity distribution on the CCD camera. And where you see red, that's where you have a lot of atoms. Where you see blue, that's no atoms. And let me first focus you on uh, these, these uh, images here. So these were, if you will, our calibration shots, where we uh, used very simple pulse sequences that we knew worked that separated the atoms by not so much distance, but basically helped us understand that we had uh, the possibility of seeing interference at, at larger distances. And uh, what, what were we looking for in these calibration shots? Well, we were looking for um, high contrast interference, which experimentally means uh, you can tune to or have relative phases between the interfering paths. I have two waves coming together. If they interfere out of phase perfectly, I expect one of the uh, output ports of that interferometer to have no probability of finding the atoms, while the other one I have high probability. Or uh, this is for the case where they're interfering out of phase, and if they interfere in phase, then that port will have all the atoms, and there would be no contamination, no probability of detecting the atoms in the other port. 
Now, in the experimental world, nothing's ever perfect, and so you always have a little bit of uh, leakage into these, uh, these other ports, and that limits the contrast of the interference and is the kind of metric that you want to use to understand whether your interferometer is working well. And we were very excited to see at the time we took this data that we had nearly perfect contrast. Uh, this was for a situation where the atoms were only separating by 1.2 centimeter. But that inspired us to uh, go to these more complicated pulse sequences where the wave packet separation uh, levers up by the sequence of pulses to distances as large as uh, 54 centimeters. And in fact, what limited us to 54 centimeters was a, a technical detail associated with our arbitrary pulse generators. We didn't have enough memory to drive even longer pulse sequences. So uh, at 54 centimeters, what do the signals look like? Well, here's, here's one where we have maximal asymmetry with respect to one port. Uh, here's one where we have maximal asymmetry to the other port. And the, the, which I say maximal, we never observed a shot. Uh, each shot or each experiment takes about 30 seconds. You have to prepare the cold gas. Uh, then you have to uh, you know, further cool it. Then you have to launch it. And the launching and detection only takes a few seconds, and you go back and start all over again and prepare. Uh, for each shot, we, we, every, when we record hundreds or thousands of shots, we never observe less population in this arm or more population in that arm, which then defines kind of a, a contrast maximum. Uh, and uh, the pictures I show you here are selected to, to illustrate these maximal conditions. Most of the shots you're at a situation where the relative phase is something intermediate between zero and pi, and you'll see a, a more balanced population uh, between these two ports. One thing I, I will get to in a, a few minutes, but it's important to mention right now, is we do not have good control over the relative phase between these two ports. And the reason for that is uh, this interferometer is extremely sensitive to very small uh, changes in the acceleration due to gravity, as I'll explain, and also vibrations. And so there were uh, just technical noise that was causing this relative phase to bounce around shot to shot. And uh, what we were observing was just the extrema uh, in, in basically here of, 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 of a sequence of data. So now if you're an experimentalist, you say, well, OK, so your signature for the interference is looking for Basically, it's looking for fluctuations in the output port. If I, if I don't have interference, I would always see kind of a 50-50 uh, distribution of atoms to one port and the next. I see interference, I start to see fluctuations. A savvy experimentalist will say, well, hang on. You know, there's lots of reasons you could see interference at the output port. Or you could say, are you kidding? That is not smoking gun evidence for interference. That could be like you have a timing jitter in your, your laser pulse. There's a lot of stuff going on. And there's lots of reasons why it might not work perfectly. So in order to be convincing, I need something that's uh, a little bit more rigorous than that. So uh, this next slide, I think, uh, provides that information. Uh, what we've done here, uh, just like you would do in any interferometer, uh, is we've tuned the relative uh, path length between the interfering arms. Uh, and uh, any interfering source has a characteristic coherence length, which I can multiply by the velocity of the interfering particle. I can, uh, turn a, I can determine the coherence length by the effective coherence time uh, associated with the interferometer. And basically, I can tune the interferometer, in our case, by just changing when the optical pulses fire so that the wave functions uh, don't overlap, or maybe to a point where they do overlap, where I expect maximal interference, to a point where they don't overlap. And I do that by changing the timing of the pulse sequence. And this timing offset is what I'm plotting on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis now, I'm showing you what happens when we look at the output ports and we look at the fluctuations of one of the output ports over an ensemble of measurements. Uh, and so uh, the data that this is derived from are pictures like I just showed you, but now we're, I'm, I'm measuring the relative peak height in, in the, the two output ports and, and plotting the variance. And there's a simple theory associated with what I should observe given by non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. Uh, and basically, once I know the coherence length of the source, uh, which is determined by the velocity spread of the source, which is something that I can measure independently with pretty high accuracy, I can predict for various interferometer geometries what the effective coherence time will be. And so uh, here I plot uh, for uh, various uh, 
wave uh, interferometer sizes, this is a 54 centimeter. We had 36 centimeter here. We had 18 centimeter there. Uh, I, I plot what this, uh, this contrast envelope looks like. And then from each one of those envelopes, I extract the width of the envelope, which is proportional to this coherence time. And on this inset, I plot the coherence time as a function of uh, wave function separation. And uh, so don't be misled by the change in heights of those peaks. That's happening. The height is changing because as I go to larger wave function uh, separation, I have more pulses in the sequence, and I, I, I don't expect to have as good contrast uh, in the interference. And so what I'm plotting here is the width of these peaks uh, as a function of separation and comparing it to a simple theory that's shown in, 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 in with the solid lines and, and my uncertainty in that theory uh, given by my uncertainty in the momentum spread of the source. And uh, here, here are the data. And so it's this data that I think provides uh, compelling and unambiguous evidence that we are actually seeing a de Broglie wave uh, interference effect on this macroscopic distance scale and this macroscopic time scale. It takes two seconds uh, for, for the, the, uh, the, the wave functions to separate and, and then recombine. And that's, that's a long enough time scale that if you're inter interested in foundation of, of quantum mechanics type stuff, uh, you, can, you can do a delayed choice experiment where, for example, We've never done this, but we could launch the ensemble of atoms, and then we could go and say, have a vote, a real quick vote for people in this room, and you could tell me how I want to set the settings of my beam splitter, and then, and then we could observe the effects of that, uh, that, that, uh, inter, inter, uh, that choice on the interference. Uh, OK, so what do we learn about quantum mechanics when we do that? Well, there, as you probably know, there are lots of alternative theories that have been posed to the standard Schrodinger uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, by the way, nobody's found a reason to throw out the Schrodinger equation. But uh, if you are interested in that, there's, there's literature of, of people trying to solve the measurement problem, uh, trying to uh, you know, understand how you might even parameterize the Schrodinger equation to uh, look for breakdowns in the theory. Uh, and from my experimental perspective, one of the things I find rather uh, interesting about testing quantum mechanics is that the theory is so darn good and also has so many uh, kind of philosophical issues on its own that it's very hard to, to generate uh, legitimate test theories. <laughs> but people try nonetheless. Uh, so uh, and I don't want that. And I'm not in TU Delft. So uh, yeah, here's where I am. Let me just take you through one of the, the recent test theories which our observation of interference has constrained. And this is kind of an interesting mechanism. Uh, what this theory, uh, which is known as the KTM model, uh, proposes is that as the wave packets of this interferometer are explore two different regions of the Earth's uh, gravitational field, because of the gravity gradient of the Earth, the acceleration due to gravity at this location is not quite the same as the acceleration due to gravity of this location, you could have a situation where if, if you didn't understand gravity and quantum mechanics and how they joined, you could have a situation where this differential acceleration could essentially be a which path meter uh, for uh, the, the interferometer. And if I have a which path meter, something that tells me the wave function went on this upper trajectory or this lower trajectory, I don't expect to see uh, interference. And the fact that we see interference means that this model, which is admittedly contrived, and uh, you know, as somebody who has been, if you've been a student of quantum mechanics and so on, you at first blush think it's kind of a crazy theory. If such a theory were true, if gravity were designed in such a way that it could provide which path information, then uh, the, the parameters of our experiment would completely rule this out. And, uh, that's what uh, this table is meant to show. Uh, th this KTM model would be associated with a dephasing time, a loss of coherence of milliseconds. And as I mentioned, our wave functions are separated for seconds. And uh, why we can test that with this apparatus is this dephasing rate, this is the dephasing rate associated with KTM, is proportional to the separation of the wave packet squared. So by separating them by 54 centimeters, we can provide a stringent test of uh, such a theory. OK, uh, and that's one example. Uh, since we published that uh, result, there have been uh, se several papers that have, have appeared that have used our data constrained of various, uh, not, I would say, not very realistic theories that extend quantum mechanics. But usually when you build an interferometer, you build it for more than just looking for contrast. I mean, you are building an interferometer as a metrological tool. You want to test 
something by measuring phase shifts. And so let me tell you a bit about uh, the phase shift sensitivity of this instrument. So I want to uh, calculate the, 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 the relative uh, phase of this path with respect to this path. This is, again, that same space-time diagram. And here, these lines are indicating the center of the, the wave packet. And uh, lots of ways of doing this. You could just use Schrodinger equation. But because there are so many wiggles in the wave function, it's convenient to think about this in a Feynman path integral uh, formulation. And uh, so in that formulation, uh, there are, you can break up the shift into a, a couple of terms. One is this uh, difference in action integrals. That's the one that basically uh, I think most of you would be familiar with, where you just count the number of de Broglie wave oscillations on one path and the other, and you compare the relative phases by subtracting. Uh, and, and that's formally uh, done by uh, computing two action integrals. Uh, there's another shift. Let me jump down here, known as we call it the wave packet separation shift. You could have an arbitrary uh, potential structure that the wave packets are moving through, such that the wave functions of the two interfering paths don't exactly overlap at their output of the or at, at the output beam splitter. In which case, in a path integral formulation, you need to have some way of comparing the phase of the center of this wave packet to the center of that wave packet, which is uh, what, what we do uh, with this term here. And finally, there's a term which many people forget the first time they hear about this interferometer, but is absolutely crucial. And that is the one associated with the interaction of the laser fields with the atoms uh, at each of the points that we uh, initiate this momentum transfer between the wave packet and, and the laser. And when you work through the uh, quantum mechanics of the atom-light interaction, what you find is that the, in a semi-classical treatment, the phase of the laser at the position of the atom is read into the atomic coherence. And so each and every time you flash in the laser, you have to kind of record, or what nature does for you, is record the phase of that laser into uh, the atomic coherence. And so for a simple three-pulse sequence, uh, recall we use much longer pulse sequences. So this, this expression would, in principle, be uh, much more complicated to write down. For a simple three-pulse sequence, I get the phase of that, those laser wave fronts simply by noting where the wave packets are each time I pulse in the laser there. And then they have these two locations and then at the exit. And uh, I, if I know the position, I multiply by the propagation vector of the light field to learn the phase of the light field. And then these terms here are the uh, initial phases of, of the light field. When I talk about the phase of a laser beam, I have to tell you where phase is equal to zero. And that's what these terms record. In the experimental data I showed you, what was happening was the mirror which roughly reflected the, the laser beam was fluctuating up and down due to the vibration of the laboratory floor. What that was doing was randomizing this term here, which was causing the phase to fluctuate uh, at the output ports of the interferometer. I will describe to you a scheme in a few minutes where we, we, we circumvent this uh, with a common mode architecture. But uh, right now, this, if you wanted to know what is the reason why we observe those phase fluctuations, it's for that term. OK, so uh, let's talk a little bit more about what we can learn by measuring phase. So I go and I make a simple model that describes the motion of the wave packets in the Earth's gravitational field. I take into account the Earth is rotating. Uh, I can also take into account that the Earth has a gravitational gradient uh, and a bunch of other stuff. In fact, we have some analysis. We call it the term list. We put the kitchen sink in there. So this is, and that term list has hundreds of terms in it. Here I have an abbreviated one where I want to focus your attention to a couple of interesting terms. Look at this one here. This is the uh, term associated with the presence of the acceleration due to gravity. Well, why do I have a term here? That's, I think that's intuitive to everyone. As the wave functions are spatially separating, they're explore, the, the, the wave halves, two halves of the atom are exploring different parts of the gravitational potential. Uh, they, see, they have different momenta, uh, different wavelengths. Uh, it's clear you're going to get a phase shift. What may not be clear is how big that phase shift is. It's huge for 54 centimeters. It's 10 to the 10 radians per shot for the data I just showed you. Now, recall that we have. Uh, between 100,000 and a million atoms in each ball, if you believe in shot noise statistics, that means I can determine that phase on a single measurement to the square root of that, uh, to a phase uncertainty given by 1 over the square root of the number of particles, or on the level of 10 milliradians almost down to 1 milliradian. And so that means that on any given shot, I am sensitive to changes in the acceleration due to gravity at the part in 10 to the 13 level. It's an exceptional accelerometer. And, uh, 
we exploit that exceptional acceleration sensitivity uh, for various uh, technological and scientific uh, applications, which I'll, sh I'll show you in the last few minutes of the talk. Uh, there's another term, and this, this term has been observed uh, for 20 years ago, and uh, uh, it's the foundation for uh, many uh, really pretty high-performing uh, sensors that measure the acceleration due to gravity. This term here, if you inspect it, is, is kind of interesting. It's the only term in this list that actually depends on Planck's constant. It also depends on the mass of the atom, and here it, it depends on the curvature of the gravitational field. This term was identified in the uh, early 90s as being interesting for uh, de Broglie inter wave interferometry for the fi following reason. It's the first term that really fundamentally uh, 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 is associated with the curvature of the, the, the uh, gravitational field. That's the gravitational gradient. Uh, and also uh, quantum mechanics. You see Planck's constant in there. And so uh, in, in general relativity, uh, Uniform accelerations are, are sort of uninteresting because if you're a believer in the equivalence principle, you can always boost to a frame where the, uh, uh, that acceleration goes away and uh, the physics is given by the local physics in that frame. Uh, and you, you, you wouldn't expect to see this, use this as a way of testing GR. So uh, it's fundamentally interesting to find an experimental situation where you have uh, 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 the wave function actually exploring the, the local uh, curvature of the gravitational field. And, that, and that's what this term does. I have more to say on that, but uh, just to say that this, this, is, this has been a term that's been sought after as something to, interesting to observe for, for decades. And look, at for these parameters, that phase shift is huge. 600 uh, radians. Earlier de Broglie wave devices, even with neutrons uh, and other cold atom, other atomic de Broglie wave devices, uh, the separation wasn't large enough to basically explore a, a, a significant a gravitational gradient, and it was very difficult to observe this term. So uh, we wanted to observe it, and we built the following uh, uh, pulse sequence to uh, create a situation where we were able to uh, isolate that term from the other terms in that term list. And this, this is what we did. We designed a sequence of pulses. Again, this is a space-time diagram, time, space, plotting the center of uh, mass of, of the interfering uh, uh, wave packets uh, for, for single atoms uh, in a reference frame that's falling with the atoms. Uh, and just by changing the way we, we apply that pulse sequence, we can create a situation where a first pulse comes, splits the wave function in two, separates them by uh, substantial distance, about 20 centimeters. Uh, then we come in and we do uh, interferometer pulse sequences where we open and close one interference loop and another interference loop simultaneously. And then uh, we bring them back together. Uh, and there are actually a, a pair of trajectories here, but because of the thickness of the line, you can only kind of see them as one. We, we have a pair of output ports. We then take one of these and deflect it so that it comes into the detection region at the same position that uh, uh, atoms in the output port of uh, this interferometer uh, come into that detection region. And we do that with, again, momentum exchange using uh, pulses of light. If you will, this interferometer here measures uh, the gravity gradient response for one value of the Earth's gravitational gradient. Uh, and this interferometer measures the gravitational gradient response for another value. I said Earth. What we're going to do is bring in a stack of lead bricks to make it so that there's a differential gravity gradient between these two locations. Because we use the same set of laser pulses to simultaneously open and close both of those loops, that laser phase cancels as a common mode. And so when I compare the relative phase between the output of this interferometer and the output of that interferometer, uh, that, that phase, uh, which is troubling, drops out. Uh, what does the data look like? Well, uh, here is, uh, since this, this experiment we just published this summer, the students and postdocs learned how to improve their false color image processing. And uh, so now here, instead of a 2D, uh, uh, you have this nice 3D rendering. And we've changed a little bit the way we observe the interference fringes. Just like with an optical interferometer, you can misalign uh, the, the output beam splitter in order to put directly spatial fringes across the, uh, the screen. Uh, we do the same thing with our de Broglie wave interferometer. We misalign uh, the final set of pulses by changing the tilt angle of, of, uh, of the laser field that we use to, to uh, do the interference. And that creates these, these well-defined uh, fringe patterns. Uh, 
And what we're doing now is we're going to compare the phase of this, the, uh, this um, fringe ensemble to the phase of that ensemble, the upper port and the lower port. And you can see there's a, for example, there's a clear phase difference between this clump of atoms and that clump of atoms. If they had the same phases, I would see a peak at this location and a peak in the center. And these, these two are clearly separated by, there's a, like a, a, a pi phase shift between the two. This is, it turns out, a great way of measuring the Earth's gravity gradient. And just to put numbers in context, we resolve the Earth's gravitational gradient 10 to the minus 7 g's per meter at better than a part per thousand in a single shot of the experiment. All right, so I want to isolate that uh, gravity gradient term. Real quickly, this is what we do. We bring a stack of lead bricks, about seven of them, uh, close to the apex of the tower uh, and the atomic trajectories, and we modulate their positions. We bring them as close as 25 centimeters to, uh, these are the interfering wave packets at the, the, the peak of their trajectories, and then we pull them away to a distance that's so far that there's really a negligible in, influence. Uh, and then we, we look to see the change in the phase shift as a function of the presence or absence of the lead, whether the lead's in or out, if you will. And if you go and you plot the gravitational uh, acceleration induced by that, that, th those uh, lead bricks, uh, here you can see it on this diagram here. This is the acceleration as a function of height. The acceleration from the lead changes by about 10 to the minus 9 g. Um, so uh, not very much, but certainly well within the statistical sensitivity of our interferometer. And you note that the upper interferometer loop sees a very different gravitational gradient uh, change in gravity as a function of distance than the lower uh, interferometer does. And so we can isolate that, that interesting term by comparing uh, the phase of this term and the, uh, the phase output of this interferometer, they will differ because there's a different gravitational gradient at those two locations. And so uh, here's the data. Uh, we we uh, basically shot number, number of times we repeated the experiment, the observed shift, whether or not the lead is at the inner position or the outer position, the phase shift is large uh, on the order of a radian, so it's easy to see this shift. And uh, then we can, for example, plot that phase shift parametrically as a function of where these wave packets are with respect to the, the lead mass. And so that's what I show you here. And then just using the, the standard theory that uh, assumes everything we believe about gravitation and physics, uh, quantum mechanics to be correct, I can, I can, I can uh, have the theory curve and our data and the agreement is uh, striking. Uh, an interesting uh, thing to note is that in this interferometer, uh, the value of the phase shift is, is basically, a, it's determined by the tidal force. It it's, depends on the difference in the gravitational acceleration between this arm and that arm. Uh, it has to be, in order to understand this phase shift, that gravity is coupling different to, differently to the, the two halves of, of the wave function. Every previous de Broglie wave interference experiment with electrons, neutrons, or atoms has been done in a situation where the gravitational coupling between the interfering paths was the same, so I could understand the output of that interference as simply uh, by, by boosting to an appropriate reference frame and as a kinematic effect. Here, it's different, and this is why this is considered uh, interesting. And, and here, if you're interested in uh, the, the, the theory foundation for this, there's this pioneering paper by Anandin in the, actually the early 80s, and then Odrech in, in, the, in the 90s specializing to atoms. This is the first time that somebody's seen the influence of gravitational curvature on a quantum wave function. Uh, it's also a great gravity gradiometer, and so uh, we can use it to measure the gravity gradient, say, of the, uh, the, the lab. And so by changing the, uh, the launch height of the atoms, we can capture and uh, understand the local mass distribution uh, that's near the wave functions. And we can make a simple theory that connects our observed phase shift to uh, that local gravity gradient. Here is the height of the uh, atom wave packets, and here's the observed gravity gradient. Uh, this red dotted curve is, uh, if you do the theory for this, which is not very interesting theory because you have to understand the mass distribution nearby. Uh, and uh, it's not, I don't expect to get excellent agreement between theory and experiment. And the black curve is, uh, is what happens when you put a spline through those points. What I mean to convey with this is, this, this configuration also very good at measuring gravitational gradients. So uh, why not think about this as a gravity gradiometer for measuring gravity gradients of things you care about? And so uh, what I want to do here is measure the gravitational gradient for example, of the Earth. 
And what I imagine doing is flying one of those instruments around the Earth and uh, using that pulse sequence, recording uh, the gravitational gradient, and using that as a way of understanding the mass distribution associated with the Earth, which depends on like, the amount of ice that's underneath the, uh, the apparatus as it's orbiting and so forth. Uh, this is a well-known uh, thing to do, and the GRACE uh, mission, uh, Gravity Recovery Mission, has done this beautifully uh, in the past, and uh, it provides a sensitivity curve. This is the angular resolution, and this is, or spatial resolution, if you will, and this is the uh, noise performance. The GRACE uh, satellites do pretty well. Uh, people are excited about the possibility for the future and are looking for a measurement method that will provide more sensitivity. And a, an atom-based system certainly looks like it will perform uh, very well. This is simulations done by Scott Lutke, our collaborator at Goddard Space Flight Center uh, uh, um, in, in Maryland. And uh, what's exciting about the simulation is that you have possibly several orders of magnitude improved resolution at higher spatial or angular frequencies, which are important for def getting a good resolution on where mass is shifting in your geophysical model of, say, the water table. Uh, this is being built. That's what the apparatus looks like. Uh, and hopefully we'll be in a situation to uh, test this apparatus and, and validate it uh, in the coming years on the ground. I want to conclude with the following slide, and uh, actually there are two more slides. I wanted, that was an application of a good gravity gradiometer. I want to tell you about uh, some more fundamental science that uh, you can explore with uh, a, a differential uh, interference measurement. And so the experiment we're doing right now is an experimental test of the equivalence principle, where we're comparing the free fall of two different ensembles of uh, atoms, a rubidium-85 ensemble and a rubidium-87 ensemble. Uh, each has its own expected phase shift in the interferometer output, which, uh, if the equivalence principle is not violated, is something we can calculate and know. And we can measure that phase shift and compare it with uh, what theory says. And if there's, a, if there's a, a violation or a difference observed, that could be due to a violation of the principle of equivalence. Due to the statistical sensitivity of our apparatus, uh, we can set very stringent limits, uh, we think, on, on this principle. And so uh, just to put some numbers up there, uh, with one month of data collection, uh, we should be able to see uh, uh, resolve changes in the acceleration due to gravity of, of 85 isotopes falling with respect to 87 isotopes at the part in 10 to the 15 level, which is comparable where microscope uh, satellite experiment, which just published some beautiful results, thinks they'll be uh, in their next run. Systematic uncertainties, well, there are plenty of systematic effects, which I, I do not have time to talk about, but it looks like those can be controlled. Uh, well, the 10 to the minus 16 level is optimistic. I think realistically, 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 15. And here's my last slide. So uh, we've modified that apparatus in order to uh, simultaneously run interferometers for rubidium-85 and rubidium-87. And so uh, at the bottom of the fountain now, we have a dual isotope source. We launch both isotopes simultaneously. They fly through the apparatus. They the wave functions spatially separate and then recombine. There's that giant sensitivity to acceleration due to gravity, which is also the sensitivity to equivalence violating physics, principle violating physics. And then these wave functions uh, eventually overlap again. They interfere. And these are pictures of the interference output ports of uh, the interferometers for rubidium-85 and rubidium-87. And what we're doing right now is we're uh, comparing the differential phase between these uh, two interferometers, say, if you will, compare the, the, the position of that peak to the position of that peak. This is one output port of the interferometer. Or the position of these peaks to those peaks, that's the other output port of the 85 and 87 interferometer, and accruing statistics. And uh, right now, we have a systematic at the part in 10 to the 12 level. We're trying to figure out where that's coming from. Uh, the statistics uh, basically uh, are showing us a statistical sensitivity at the 10 to the minus 14 level. So at this point, uh, I'll conclude, and I, I want to thank you for your attention, and I want to thank uh, my students and postdocs and co-PI, uh, co uh, Jason Hogan, uh, for their work on this experiment. Thank you. Professor Kazevich for this uh, very interesting talk. Are there any questions in the audience?
Can you just explain a bit more uh, which are the two uh, output ports? Which are the two output ports? Uh, more in, in detail. Uh, should I go back to like, uh, okay, so how do I get the, uh, wrong way. Okay, so for this data in particular, uh, so at this point, we have a final pi over two pulse, which uh, is the beam splitter. And just like if you're building an optical interferometer, in comes the laser, and part of the beam is reflected in this direction, and part of the beam is reflected in that direction. Uh, the interfering wave packets go along different trajectories. And a, a short time later, those differing trajectories spatially separate. This is one of the trajectories, and that's the other trajectory. They're in the same region of our detector, so when we flash on a pulse of light to detect where the atoms are, uh, we'll see two clumps of atoms, which now have this spatial corrugation, be corrugation because I've misaligned the laser beams. And this then would be uh, one of those output ports, and this would be the other output port. And that's for rubidium-85. Uh, the same thing is happening for rubidium-87. Uh, and in order to put both collections of uh, ports on the same camera screen, if you will, we introduce a little bit of extra momentum to the 87 ports after the final beam splitter so that they show up on the screen as shown here. Does that answer your question? Great, thanks. Um, I'm not sure if I understood this correctly, but um, uh, if you go back to the slide where you showed the Raman phase shift, uh, then uh, this phase shift, phase shift was propor proportional to the wave number k, right? And if you do the experiment, um, well, exactly, no, no, is the slide before that? The slide before that? Um, yeah, exactly, the, the, the Raman shift is proportional to the, um, to the wave number, and if you um, do two different, um, uh, if you split your, your beam and then you do the, the thing that you did in the slide after that, where you have uh, your two different interferometers at different heights, mm -hmm. um, do you have to include like, things like the um, gravitational redshift of the, uh, of the wave number uh, into, this, uh, into this kitchen sink in the, to sort of get different, uh, different redshifted um, wave numbers for the, for the two uh, Raman terms for the two interferometers at the different heights? Yeah, I, I love the question, excellent question. So the question is, uh, do we have, because this is, I mean, we're probing uh, 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 accelerations at some minuscule level, and you might be, since you, you look at this uh, term list, if you will, and you see that it depends on the size of the, 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 the magnitude of the propagation vector of the light, you might be worried that uh, there's a redshift between the propagation vector uh, at, at this location and that location, which itself uh, causes an observable phase shift term. So I would love it if we had enough sensitivity to see that we are not quite at that level. So that, 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 the, the, the redshift on the frequency of the light that's used to drive, the, uh, drive these transitions is uh, small enough that it's, it's at part in 10 to the 16. And for our parameters, it's, it's not large enough to be observable. But in, I, we've calculated it, and it, it is observable in some future topologies that we'd like to do. Looking towards the future, what I'd love to do is have those wave packets separated by eight meters and then bring them back together. In that case, this redshift you described is certainly there. Yeah, great question. Could you tell us a little bit more about this uh, term that was proportional to h bar, the one, pr uh, the one that, that fills uh, the curvature of gravity? Is, is it some unru, some Hawking kind of uh, effect? Or? Uh, I, so it's not as exotic as that. In fact, it, it just, uh, it'd be great. If, and in this, in this theory, there are, there are, I can point to some papers where there are Hawking-like terms out there. But no, in order to see a Hawking-like term, uh, or sorry, an unru like term, you need to be accelerating at dramatic levels, like for benchtop Hawking, uh, legitimate uh, Unruh type, 10 to the 20 G. Uh, and we're nowhere near that. So Unruh, uh, it would be great to be uh, sensitive enough to see that. We're, we're nowhere close to seeing Unruh. Where does this term come from? It just comes from, uh, uh, you, you can calculate it if you believe quantum mechanics uh, and you, uh, you, you uh, 
do the quantum theory for this interferometer in the curved gravitational potential, where you just have two different values for a gravity uh, where, where the two arms are. You, and so uh, that's, that's depending on your, your, your taste for theoretical rigor, uh, that either triggers a, a, uh, you know, a, a fully general relativistic calculation, or you can use perturbation theory to, to get the answer with a lot less work. Uh, so it, it just flows from that. And then where it becomes conceptually interesting is if, well, you say, well, I don't really feel like I know enough about gravity to say how it behaves on quantum wave functions that have large spatial extent. And that's where you have a, a very limited number of test theories that could be constrained. Is there a last question? Yes. When you absorb a, a, a light pulse, then your wave packet split, splits into two parts. Mm -hmm. Now you have a gravity which is no longer a homogeneous and constant. So um, if I think of a theory of gravity, I would also need to quantize gravity. So it could also get splitting of the beams by absorbing or not absorbing a graviton or something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, now, now, uh, thanks for the question. This uh, and uh, once you start using the word graviton, I am now no longer in my field of expertise. <laughs> but what I would say is that if you if you did want to quantize in, in this way, which and and that's where there is, uh, as I understand it, a, a, a lot of theoretical interest these days. Uh, we're in a regime that you could think of as semi-classical, where there are, given the strengths of the gravitational, these classical fields that we're using right now a lot of gravitons associated with those fields. And so uh, it would be very uh, un unlikely uh, to get into a regime where you start to resolve, the, the, say, the, the ill-defined quantum field, field theory of single graviton with this apparatus. But uh, already I'm on thin ice, as they say, and uh, uh, there are others who are much more expert in talking about this. If there is no further question, then We'll thank you again, Professor Kazevich. Thank you.